in this globalization crosswalk, a topic which is in the mouth of everybody, not only in Mexico and Latin America, but also at worldwide level in the European Union, China, Japan, Australia, everywhere. Korea, especially both Koreas, has been how to negotiate with Trump. All of us believe that it is impossible to negotiate with him. But yesterday, we discovered that this is a myth. Uh, uh, it is possible to negotiate with him. Let's see what are the expectations in the future. It is not easy, because all of them are good negotiators, each one with other uh, Xi Jinping, Mr. Trump, Macron, Merkel, everybody has their own style and look for the best for their economies, their countries, and people. At the end, we cannot sit down and cry. We saw the fact of reality, but this back to reality has to continue. So let's start with the presentations in this environment, getting back to reality. And now let's get back to reality, see some of the topics. The first uh, World War trade worldwide, and then we will see the last Silk Road the new scope of the Pacific Partnership and Mercosur. We will see the challenge of the uh, fiscal reform of Mr. Trump, and we will see also the global new economic agenda, including the TPP. And we will also see Cyprus uh, position uh, by our colleague from Cyprus, and then closing, making business with China and Hong Kong. In order to continue, then, we need to inaugurate officially our event. We usually do it now. So I will ask my good friend, Hugo Lopez Araiza, to make the official inauguration of this event. At quarter before noon, October the 1st, 2018, I formally declared open the 19 yearly conference of UC and CS America, UC and CS Global, the topic globalization, the new economic map road. Please be welcome. Thank you very much, Hugo. Let's then start with the topic of the World Trade War and how one of the partners says how to do it, not how not to do it, how to negotiate with this new scenario. We invited for this a good friend, a great professional. Within that cooperation framework with the Colegio de Mexico, the Mexico College, we believe that it is the economic, political, and social leading position of Mexico and probably the world. Dr. Gustavo Vega Canovas, General Secretary of Colegio de Mexico, will present. He has a PH in political science in Yale and also a law bachelor degree from Nacional Autónoma de Mexico University. He has written different books, How IT, History and Dreams, and also Mexico and the United States, Political Economics for Free Trade, written by him in 2014. Many more books I'm just mentioning, the main ones. The Second Mandate of Obama, Canada, Political Democracy, Great Problems 
or big problems of Mexico, NAFTA. He's one of the main experts in this topic. And many of their other articles like trade diplomacy in the United States in the uh, transatlantic agreement, TTIP, United States and global trends in Mexico. The integration of the U.S. in trade agreements with Trump's administration, investment in the United States, many more topics. And he has different uh, appointments as a researcher professor of Colegio de Mexico, associate researcher of uh, the studies of Mexico, United States, the uh, University of San Diego, different positions to the general secretary of Colegio de Mexico. He has been also director of international studies of Colegio de Mexico, coordinator of interinstitutional program of the regional studies of North America, Iran, and also the technological the Tech ITESM from Monterrey, Associate Director of North America Studies and from uh, Dohan University, North Carolina, recent research as visitor uh, professor of international studies of CIDE, a very prestigious institution, visitor professor of the subject, Matias Romero, Latin American Study of the Texas University Visitor Professor in the Institute of uh, Politic Studies of Provence, France, distinction as a member of the editorial committees from CIDE and researcher in Mexico, government positions, member of the advisor board of international negotiations at the Secretary of Economy and many more positions. So we give the floor to Gustavo. Welcome. Very kind with your introduction. It was not necessary to mention everything. It is my pleasure to be with you as I was last year in the same event. When Mauricio asked me to participate in this seminar, this session, was to talk about the trade war. But I thought it was important to give you a very quick historical background to understand why we are at this position with this so radical change. Uh, this is not unprecedented, but it is dramatic in the trade policies of the United States. The core idea in this topic is that all of us that are devoted to international and economic topics know that for many years, in fact, since the end of the Second World War, the United States was traditionally the country that led and defended international trade order called the post-war liberal trade order that favored the idea of one of the fundamental formulas for international relationships and economic relationship was to favor trade, liberty, all over the world, trade freedom, to help all, all countries to overcome tensions, discrimination. In fact, if you check the main statements and read the inauguration discourse of uh, Mr. President Russell, uh, Roosevelt and those that were in the Second World War, how they interpreted what happened in that war, 
the fundamental vision was that the cause of that war was that the nations in Europe favored that notion of interest or preference areas and blocking other countries to get benefits from international trades. In Germany, Hitler, in the first stage of the war, made some trade agreements that discriminated other countries. And many other nations started to seek other markets. So that was the idea to create an international or favoring international trade. And this was led by the United States. As you know, uh, it convinced European countries, uh, stating that it was important that they worked together, especially because the Soviet Union showed that they had a different vision on how to lead this international order. So they created the notion of a liberal order that could be the formula to get benefits for everybody. And this was promoted along with other Latin American and European countries, as you know. They created the idea of the GATT as a mechanism through which countries could negotiate in a permanent manner some tariffs reductions. And not only the war was created by the idea of closing markets, but the big depression was accelerated because most of the countries, when they had a depression, instead of looking uh, for formulas to seek for economic recovery, all of them blocked and closed. They increased their trade tariffs, and they made worse the depression. So the idea was to change, to change and look for institutions like the GATT, the World Bank, so all countries could agree and cooperate. So that was the role that the United States traditionally played. And you know that this has changed. It is not that the United States hasn't experienced protectionism. In the 19th century, President Madison and Jefferson had closing trade policies because they felt that it was important to strengthen the production system in the United States. But there was a combination between an open market and protectionism. But in the Second World War, the idea was to open. So that was what we thought that the United States represented. But now, after some tensions from the 80s, uh, President Reagan and Nixon also had unilateral measures to force their trade partners to initiate multilateral trade agreements. But the formula used to be multilateral. But now, suddenly, currently, you have a president saying, this is not working anymore. We now want a new regime where the United States goes first. We need to take advantage of our power to obtain benefits. So this is a vision where trade agreements that are not favoring, that are not given a surplus to the United States, they are considered a failure, especially because he has a vision of a real state seller, where you win, you lose. They are not thinking about the multiple stakeholders trying to have a win-win. He has that vision along with his supporters, Mr. Navarro, they all have that vision that the United States has been given 
too many concessions for a long time, and it is important to recover the control and benefits. So this has happened. And how could we explain this? How this is explained by Trump? How we have a leader of this kind leading the most important economy all over the world. As we know, China and the European Union are also important, Japan as well. But the United States is still the leader economy at worldwide level. So it is a concern that the United States took an antagonist vision of uh, what we had in the post war liberal economy. How could we explain this? As I said, the United States, after the Second World War, led this liberal idea. But if you see carefully, since the 60s, we started to have this swift in the US trade policy that accelerated international trade opening. The US support for the European Union creation where European markets grew and the support of the US to Japan and support to countries like Taiwan, Korea, precisely to favor in order to tackle the Soviet position of closed order in a different vision, made to have a lot of competition in their own economy. They started to receive lots of imports from Korea, Taiwan, but this was deliberately because the U.S. felt that it was important to support the growth of those nations to strengthen the European Union, to block China that was the communist threat. So they had to be successful, showing that a liberal free trade system was better than a communist Order. So they started receiving a lot of imports, and they started to have a growing competition there. At the same time, there was a change in technology. Robotization started to show up in manufacturing systems, and it started to exert a huge uh, stress on labor. In 1971, U.S. experiences the great deficit in its trade balance. So President Nixon back then decided to start multilateral negotiations. He felt that European countries took too much advantage of the American trade opening. So he imposed an over rate of 10% in a unilateral manner based on the fraction 232 of national security, which is precisely the one Trump is using. So he created that feeling of an important change. And then the country said, OK, let's start negotiating. And that's when the uh, Kennedy and Token round the Tokyo and Kennedy order or round started. So there were some signs that the US was changing its position. As international competition grew in the United States, some companies asked for protection, especially those that are labor intensive. Some other said, 
I need to capture international markets. So we had a situation where with the negotiation of new multilateral trade rounds and the big opening in the 90s, that pressure for protectionism and competition was reduced because there was a big opening and a growth, especially in Clinton's economy. So the protection demands diminished. Then we still had competition in the economy and many companies in some other sectors started to be displaced with a combination of robotization and competition. In 2001, as you know, the United States and other Western countries decided to grant the status of most favored uh, nation. So then China started to penetrate international markets. And that expansion that in 2005 was almost 15% in 2015, from 2 to 15%, from 2005 to 2015, and the uh, market went from 18 to the GDP went from 12 to 15. And then the production process along with that formula that in the United States was implemented to support the idea of market opening was that those workers that were displaced by international trade had a support program where they were given <coughs> jobs to make that transition to new jobs in the service sector. So those programs were important, uh, but they were also, they disappeared. So there was a growing competition, and then support programs were eliminated. And we can see that in the manufacturing sector that was employing one out of 18 workers in 1987. In 2015, it was one per each 130, and today it's 50 of current positions could get automated for 2055. This is going to give you a clear idea of the automation. See how the garment industry, primary metals, textiles, paper, leather products, glass products, from 1977 to date, positions have decreased from 164. Today, it's only 5.8. Since 1977, in the apparel industry, we have lost 96.5% and 82 in primary metal industries in textile, 82 87.2. So there is a lot of pressure from these sectors and labor unions. Another idea, how workers have lost job positions as clerics or bookkeepers. Sorry to say that, but some job positions in your areas have been lost since 1972. Typists, telephone operators, all repetitive tasks have been 
automated and job positions have disappeared. Now, the Chinese threat in combination with automation. In 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization. And as you can see, the position of China was not so important back then. And see how they have grew a lot, as well as the uh, trade deficit of the United States. And uh, President Trump wants to have a better deal for US exports. What's happening here is that the number of international barriers have allowed China to increase its exports. And somehow, according to the US perspective, according to their system, they import less from the United States. And what they are trying to do is to get them to open their market. And I remind you, probably the same kind of frictions between the United States with China took place with Japan when Japan started to penetrate the US market with electronics and cars. In the US, they felt that there was a restricted system and they forced Japan in the 80s to sign voluntary restriction agreements. They needed to reduce in a voluntary manner your exports. And the Japanese said, OK, I'm going to skip US barriers, and I'm going to invest in the United States. So they opened their manufacturing plants. Along with this, we have another phenomenon. On equality in the United States has grown in the society. As you can see, 1% of the revenues have captured a bigger proportion of GDP. See, from 1980, along all the tax system and tax deductions in Republican administrations. That's why there's an increase in inequality. Therefore, and let's talk about this reduction, support of uh, workers displaced in Denmark, it's two 0.05 and C in Germany, 0.63. So this also has cost the current situation. In summary, what help us to understand Trump appearance is the combination of all these factors. Automation, the increase of inequality due to tax reforms and US policies the great international competition for the manufacturing US sector have created this big pressure. So in the 2016 elections, he won. Those that voted for Trump were exactly the sectors that were affected by imports uh, from China, etc. That's why we have the change. What did he say? Our country is in serious problems. We do not have victories. When have we seen China winning a trade agreement? And remember that with Mexico, also he said that the NAFTA was wrong, and then Trans-Pacific Partnership, and it is not only a political party, but also in, as you know, Bernie Sanders was one of the competitors. And he was saying exactly the same as Mr. Trump, not only Mr. Trump 
and some other labor unions. This is good news for the planet that we do not have that agreement of the TPP. So there is a consensus in the United States, especially in the political arena, not among the population. Some surveys or polls show that Americans are in favor of free trade agreement, but not the elite. The new policy of the United States dictates this white voters were left behind by globalization, the growing Chinese threat and a negative impact on international trade agreements are elements that no doubt helped Mr. Trump to reach the power. What was uh, his seven point policy at the beginning of his administration Remember the TPP agreement at his first day of uh, his administrator, then appoint hard negotiators and intelligent negotiations. He has demonstrated that Heisen is a very hard negotiator. Today in the morning or yesterday, Carl Asher, representative of the sector, gave an interview and he said that it was really unpleasant to negotiate with this person because they cannot hear. They just want to impose their own point of view. So we needed to be patient to acknowledge that the important was to have a beneficial agreement, but it was stressing. And that's what they understand about hardship. And then the idea to direct the trade secretary to, ident to identify those relationships that harm the United States and also renegotiate or abandon the NAFTA, instruct the Treasury Department to label China as a foreign um, manipulator. Then they discovered that it was not China. So a foreign currency manipulator, and then instruct the USTR to present trade demands at the World Trade Organization. That no doubt has been done. Use the uh, presidential power to remediate any trade disputes. So how this is going to be interpreted? The trade agenda was to extend free trade agreement to be more beneficial for the United States, increase um, foreign and promote reciprocity. How they interpreted reciprocity equals to accept when there's a, a difference in the deficit, this will be reduced regardless of the uh, reason of the deficit, it's more due to investments. It is more like a problem on how we're going to be able to reduce the deficits through concessions of, the, of other countries. And this program is, uh, strengthened the manufacturing base and expand agriculture exports to the agenda was to defend national sovereignty, apply in, in a more strict way trade laws in the U.S., use the influence of the U.S. to open foreign markets, to negotiate new and better trade agreements. We have been highlighting unilateral measures and the release of tariffs that we'll be referring to, but also it, we need to search for new trade agreements that would be useful for them. What, what have been the relevant actions of the first year of Trump, or one and a half year, to support the national security strategy? What, what, what is like the period of time since the adoption of unilateral measures and the deadline where all those studies were initiated. The U.S., even though they are taking unilateral actions in some way, this is a country that has a legal and constitutional system which is uh, solid. 
It is not that easy for the president because he wants to do it, to initiate actions that are not supported by prior studies carried out by the uh, institutions that are stated in the Constitution. The period of time that elapsed from the studies carried out and then the actions taken have were well what we have seen in in the last uh, American governments one of the the areas or laws were the US like uses more frequently in order to try to prevent and to stop imports that they consider that are against them, it is the trade remedies laws. And you see that there's a trend in the past, the president like we're using, like for Carter, were, Carter was Democrat. Reagan was, he used this kind of laws, Clinton less, Bush, Obama, but see Trump how he has been using the trade remedies laws. How those uh, unilateral measures are being used, anti-dumping and compensatory rights, safeguards based on Section 201, national security, Section 232, and unfair trade of China, Section 301. So there are one first question that is important to ask ourselves. Is there's legal basis for threats, Trump's threats, to carry out this? and? We find that according to the U.S. Constitution, the Congress has delegated to present huge power to restrict the global trade, not for negotiating. That does not have like the uh, limited power. So there he requires a very specific participation of the Congress to negotiate, but to restrict, he has been given power for the Trade Expansion Act of 1962 establishes in its section 232 he can impose restrictions to imports if they find if he finds the national security is under threat who decides this the president unfortunately and there's been cases because now the big issue is who decides this it could be the supreme court or the judicial branch, but it is like an arrangement between the Congress and, well, the vision of the expert, it, it is an agreement between the Congress, the executive, but the president in some way can decide on this. Well, obviously by consensus or having a discussion with leaders, but in some way it's normally the president who decides this. There's been cases in the past they have tried to limit the authority of the president and the decisions made in the judicial branch is that it is a discretionary authority of the president. It would be arbitrary, but this is the reality. And this explains why all those actions that we have been seen in the last months. For example, the Trade Act of 1974, Section 102, to lead with serious deficits in trade balance, the president can impose a maximum of 15% of tariffs. Section 301, if, if he finds that a foreign country unfairly restricts the trade of the US, the president can take actions, retaliation actions, including trade measures. And also, he del trading with the enemy, also he can delegate wide powers in times of war, and also the International Emergency Economic Powers Act also gives uh, grant uh, huge powers to regulate all the international trade forms. This was used in the past with the Soviet Union, but there's uh, legal uh, basis, obviously, in the implement NAFTA Implementation Act in Chapter 22, it, any member can withdraw the treaty after six months of given notice. So this is the Democles spate that we have had in the last few months 
where we started negotiating with Mexico. And also, the well, in few words, there are several laws that grant the president legal powers in order to carry out the actions that he has been using. And this slide shows how the the battle, well, using the term that Mr. Mubarak asked me, the trade war. The first trade war that was initiated was in the the solar panels that, according to Trump, uh, jeopardize uh, the U.S. October 31st, the U U.S. ITC, United States International Trade Commission, which is the institution that by law or by constitution has to carry out investigation to recommend a, a, an action of this kind, carry out investigation, and recommended the president to apply tariffs because of the damage caused by the uh, wash, washing machines and solar panel industry in the American industry. So they imposed those safeguard measures and automatically China investigated as a retaliation measure to import and uh, sorghum. So the U.S. in January 2018, they imposed or uh, safe, global safeguards on $8.5 billion in solar panel and $1.8 million in washing machines. What happened? Korea presented a broader case to the WTO to protest the imposition of the tariffs, and the case is still pending in the WTO. And the gov Chinese government announced uh, anti-dumping measures, etc. So we have a policy that it, it is tit for that. Tick for that, it is like uh, an eye for an eye, probably. It is according the, as the U.S. takes action, the rest of the countries replicate it when they consider that they are breaching the WTH, which is international system that in some way regulates this kind of activities. So in solar panels and washing machines, the government supposedly they have had some kind of negotiations. But what we do have at the end is that we have made progress. Uh, steel and aluminum, it is the next, the next products that were decided to affect based on the National Security Act and Section 232. The 16th February, the Department of Trade uh, reported argumenting that the steel and aluminum products are a threat for national security and they would be subject to tariffs. And um, they were applied to several countries, among them the European Union, Korea, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, Canada, as you all know, Mexico and Canada also were imposed to them and then they were exempted as, as, uh, if they would uh, reach a good agreement they will be exempted of those tariffs so in Korea what happened in China also adopted uh, retaliation measures equivalent to 2.4 billion dollars compared to the 2.8 million that US put in tariffs. Well, South Korea was exempted of steel tariffs in exchange of having transformed the free trade agreement negotiated with the U.S., in which it was decided to accept a reduction to their exports to 70 percent of the volume that they were exporting to the U.S. So as Korea accepted to reduce the exports, the U.S. eliminated the tariffs. But China, no. So, so we have a, where a situation where the three countries well, have been obliged to negotiate with the U.S. This is a reduction of their exports in the to the in to the U.S. So 
to have them exempted in, uh, in the tariffs. So the rest of the countries try to apply strategic tariffs in such a way that the U.S. mainly apply this to sectors, regardless of products, that would most uh, be painful to leaders or committees or congressmen that m will oblige Mr. Trump to modify the policy. I don't know if you remember when in Mexico and the U.S., when you, we had the agreement for of, uh, transportation buses mobility. We have an executive agreement and it was eliminated. Mexico used 2.3 billion retaliation to strategic products, agricultural products in the U.S. And this caused that Mr. Obama uh, stepped back after this Mexican policy. So with Mr. Pront, this is not working. And the big question is why? It is not working that because there was a reconsideration of the policy. The vision of Mr. Trump is that the, econ the American economy is very strong and there's no negative impact that those tariffs would have. Well, he hasn't been convinced even that there are studies that try to prove him that there could be important impacts. For example, who will be affected because of the steel and aluminum tariffs. We see all the countries that are affected, Vietnam, India, etc., and who were exempted. And based on a series of negotiations uh, the U.S. Uh, have been doing, those are the answers. Uh, for example, Canada applied tariffs to steel, aluminum, agricultural products, and other consumption goods, European Union, uh, agricultural products, and food, uh, China, fruit, nuts, ex uh, well, expecting that the U.S. would uh, reduce his position. What would are those agricultural products that have been affected by the retaliation of other countries? Sugar, rice, vegetables, wheat, corn, soya beans. So what Mr. Trump did, he established a program of $12.5 billion for the ones that were affected. So we see that Mr. Trump, it is not convinced about giving in in terms of the retaliation measure, measures of the other countries. Well, Mr. Trump is really convinced that he should be doing about the theft of intellectual property, technology, and other trade unfair practices led by China. What happened? We have that Mexico has imposed uh, tariffs and China has taken retaliation upon this. And the theft of intellectual properties continued. So currently is threatening that it will get, will cover more than 90% of the Chinese trade that goes to the U.S. So as we can see, there's, uh, he's fully convinced how this uh, conviction is explained. In, well, in the first stage, Trump was surrounded by groups that stop those measures. But currently, the ones that are really convinced that the U.S. is losing in terms of global trade all have or uh, have influence in him and convincing him that what he's doing is is good the imposition of tariffs in the u.s is co continuous escalating and now represents around 200 billion dollars of the import value another issue that is like a damocle uh, spade a sword it is cars like a threat of national security there was an investigation initiated and also there's been public audiences and 
they are talking about the possibility to increase the tariffs in 25 percent. This may cost most of the studies around those tariffs demonstrate that the impact on employment in the U.S. could be really negative. The thing is that the study shows probably there will be this uh, expressed in the medium term and not in the short term. That's why Mr. Trump has not uh, given in. So what can we tell about the institutional elements that could limit the trade policy of Trump? Well, in one first element, I think it is important to note that even though there's a Republican majority in the Congress, there's a div clear division in the Republican Party about the trade subject. The Republicans have als always had a pro-free trade agenda. As you all know, Paul Ryan will retire, but Mitch McConnell is favoring the free trade. And they contributing to ensure the Republican support to the law of trade promotion authority that gave origin to the negotiation with NAFTA. Other elements that probably would, would limit and make him to modify the trade policy of Trump is the midterm elections in November 2018 will renew the representative chamber and 35 of the seats of the Senate. We will expect to have a change in the Senate. In, uh, in the Senate, Democrats only need two seats in order to take control. The, probably the elections of 2018 will change the electorate priorities in the electoral districts that elected Trump even. 32 Republicans elected for the first time in 2016 sent a letter to Lies Kaiser expressing their concern on the trade policies of Trump and the potential damage to businesses, agricultures, all also, it will be very uh, serious to withdraw the, the withdrawal of the U.S. from NAFTA. Those 27 represent parts of the U.S. that voted for Trump during the presidential elections. And also, this is a possibility that probably this would change the composition of trade. And also, I think that there's a possibility that this will stop the policy of Trump. Uh, the Peterson studies demonstrate that the impact in the loss of jobs could be really important in the future. We have for each employment that is one in the steel workers, producers, and aluminum, it will be lost. 18 jobs in other industries. Also, as I said, uh, Trump uh, launched a, a bailout of 20 billion for agriculture or farmers that have received many criticism. So those are the proposals initiated by Trump. But also it was proposed to negotiate agreements that will be useful for all Americans. So we mentioned that the first in this part of the agenda, he talked about withdrawing the TPP, but as you all know, in the last few months, he has talked about recovering this. The paradoxical issue here, which is interesting to mention, this is the end part of my presentation, and the NAFTA negotiation. Many of what was negotiated in the TPP's recovery in the negotiation of NAFTA. So the TPP 11 or the CPTPP was, was negotiated with Japan and with the rest of the countries that we are members with the idea that this is going to be an agreement that will still be open so the U.S. will be able to participate in it. Well, the negotiation of the CPTPP was made to, froze, to freeze the provisions of the agreement that U.S. insisted to negotiate on and to be included in the same one. The agreement between the 11 countries that are signatories of the CPTP 
that we need to be, give the opportunity to the U.S. to initiate there. The idea behind it, they are calculating that this was, that Mr. Trump is carrying out cannot survive for a longer period of time. Probably in the future administration, probably there will be, this will be reconsidered, or probably they will go back to the CPTPP. The, the door is uh, open. Another example, the TPIP, which is a transatlantic agreement negotiated by Europe and the U.S., as you all know, it was left aside, but well, there's been discussions around that this will be uh, rethought. Uh, in the negotiations carried out to eliminate tariffs imposed to the European Union, they are thinking about the possibility of having an agreement without calling it TTIP. If we see what they are promoting as a negotiation is an agreement that is basically what was negotiated before. The total elimination of tariffs is what is uh, proposing because Trump in his uh, lack of knowledge, well, I, I think he doesn't know. I don't want to... Uh, abuse but when he says is you have too high tariffs and we have too low tariffs so European Union said okay let's eliminate them okay it's okay it's a good idea this is what they are, were originally doing in the TTIP and they were trying to find new regulatory frameworks to standardize the regulation process and foster uh, trade and this is the agenda that we lead the negotiations with the EU so what is going on is that the Mr. Trump does not understand but in some way he if they are able well the negotiate negotiators like it happened with the NAFTA without telling him that they are including things of the TPP well, Mr. Trump will say, we're winning, so he will say, that's okay, but he already won this with the TPP. Now, what the NAFTA uh, achieved is to confirm that this was a good idea, but don't call it this way, otherwise it's a problem. So, uh, well, with the EU, they are negotiating something very similar to uh, NAFTA. So what happened with the agreements I mentioned the Korean agreement. The Korean agreement was an agreement that negotiated in terms of free trade, but Korea intelligently interested in taking advantage of the U.S. proposal to eliminate nuclear weapons for uh, North Korea. It was, this, it was important to find a formula to maintain the interest of Trump in the, to eliminate uh, nuclear weapons and at the same time to ensure that not to lose attention. So when the U.S. said we need to renegotiate and I want you to eliminate your steel imports or to reduce your steel imports, I think Korea thinking in its own security interests said, okay, I need to accept those changes where at the end of the day I won't lose a lot because I am very, very competitive in terms of exports. So if I no longer export the 30% of what I'm exporting to the U.S., I can export to other countries because I'm very competitive. So he did, he not only accepted this, but also he accept, it accepted in the agreement to increase the amount of uh, bosses that would accept, be accepted in the Korean economy from 20, from 25,000 to 50,000. What he did that, so he, uh, they wrote a letter with the advice of experts, say the Korean negotiators mocked uh, in an informal discussion in Washington saying that anyways, if we 
if we open more the market, Korea don't doesn't like the American buses. Probably we won't buy them any. We cannot be obliged. We will open the market, but that doesn't mean that the consumer will buy them. So this is like the strategy that Korea used. But at the end of the day, what they were favoring is their vision of having the U.S. support for security matters. So this is what this is the agreement. So, well, also, Mr. Mubarak asked me to talk about the, what happened yesterday, which is the NAFTA that we are all interested in. So, as you all know, the NAFTA had like ups and downs from the beginning. From the definition of the worst agreement of the history negotiated of the U.S. Uh, to, to the a very important agreement that needed to be negotiated. There was uncertainty around this. If you read or you read the book called, I forgot the name, but the Washington Post writer about Trump, well, he reveals based on the interviews that in the first instance, Trump was uh, asked, well, uh, said that he was going to withdraw the NAFTA, but one of the collaborators, uh, well, removed the letter, and well, he was supposed to sign the letter for of the NAFTA withdrawal, and then he forgot about the letter, and someone said this is uh, crazy and the letter was just uh, forgotten, and this is revealed in the book. And this is how Mr. Trump behaves. He sleeps four or three hours per day. He's under this uh, short span of attention, and the tweeters, and the, but he did not withdraw the NAFTA. However, at the same time, when it was, when the negotiation agenda was proposed, uh, the agenda was too wide, too broad, an ambitious agenda. It's an, it was an agenda that did not only cover the topics that were included in NAFTA, but new topics that were uh, important to modernize the agreement. So this explains that Mexico and Canada, even though with all the insults made to Mexico, that they were like uh, beaten like a piñata, so they saw the opportunity that there was a great room for improvement to uh, negotiate something that could be useful for Mexico. And the proof is that they sat together and they said, let's negotiate. So we all know the agenda. You have seen the agenda in this one and a half years. But there was tension around what were the topics that they should be included or not. We wanted to have new topics. Why it was important to renew the NAFTA? Because only the during the period of time made the NAFTA obsolete. Well, there was no mechanism. Well, there was a mechanism, but it didn't work f to review it when something was missing or to modernize it or update it. So there was no uh, chap a chapter about e-commerce, and this has increasingly increased now, and there was no chapter that would regulate a possible e-commerce. In the dispute resolution mechanism, in some instances were not applicable. It was important to renew them. In telecommunications, more investment was needed. In financial services, we needed also to update many other aspects. So, a very wide agenda was considered, including all this. Yesterday at 11 or 12 p.m., they already dropped these chapters. In the first presentation, I put a bilateral agreement and today early in the morning, I 
change this because it is also in the version uh, negotiated with Canada. So we have all these of agriculture, industrial goods, origin rules, trade remedies. All this was in the NAFTA before. So it was renewed, renegotiated in the new agreement. How exactly? We need to see that in detail, but they are included. All these 32 new chapters in the new um, Mexico, United States and Canada agreement. The name was changed because uh, Mr. Trump said NAFTA was something that I wanted to transform. I wanted to be a new agreement. Fortunately, he didn't ask it to be named Trump or any of his supporters' name. And what can we see in the new agreement? We can see that some elements of investment chapter of financial services, telecommunication, um, also properties and environmental chapters are added also electronic trade, <coughs> small industries, and then also intellectual property, anti-corruption anti development, facilitation of trade and customs and also state-owned companies that they have market basis and not mercantilism basis, which are the ones that are usually taken. Therefore, we have a coexistence between the NAFTA 2.0 and the TPP 11 that we already signed off. What do we know now about the negotiations? It was uh, published last night in the trade representation website that there is a modernization of 21st century um, provisions and the margin of purchases is uh, rates from 50 to 100 US dollars without tariffs or duties, and these will favor also trade among SMEs and then financial services. We have a very important regime here also in the labor and environmental area. There were some new elements and where we have some issues is in these origin rules topics, which I want to go deeper into details. There you have something important is that we need to be clear that the agreement is far from being a material fact. It has been criticized because it has a mix of positive and negative provisions, and it will need the ratification of both Congresses, especially the one of the United States, implying hard work in these last two months that they go to the Congress, you can have a lot of changes on the last minute. Interest groups, congressmen could try to modify it. And what's important on the positive side of this new agreement. Many of the provisions of the CTPP have been taken, even those that were suspended. It seems that they are going to be included beyond the CTPP that could be considered positive, and then they are modernized with uh, 21st century provisions, and it is expected that it promotes employment, competitiveness, and trade in the North American region. Digital trade um, assures uh, the free flow of data, text, images, and voice. It protects intellectual property and also has the source code 
prohibits the measures of uh, servers that are receiving country location. It also guarantees 10 years of exclusivity to cost for uh, data to um, medical products and 75 years of protection of copyrights and also prohibition measures to prevent uh, piracy. And now we have a minimum of $100 free from duties with a certificate which is above $50. Canada also agreed to increase it to $100, and this will facilitate online trade not only from Amazon, but also small businesses, financial services will warranty the same uh, trade freedom from uh, bank brokerage between Mexico and this is close to the practice that we have and it is important to warranty, especially with the government of uh, Lopez Obrador that will demand to comply in the future. In agriculture, we had big issues and this blocked the negotiation for many months. Mexico didn't give, give away. It was the idea that exports were going to be interrupted in some uh, seasons of the year. That was what the United States wanted. So the free trade regime is strengthened and the warranties of new agriculture biotechnology techniques are reinforced and scientific criteria with prevail and we apply it to trade. You know that some countries prefer to use instead of a scientific approach to establish um, safety measures, they prefer the preventive focus. Okay, just five minutes. This uh, preventive approach means that simply because the consumer doesn't like hormones in steak, they don't want to buy it because there's a rumor that they cause health issues. Therefore, for preventive measures, they block imports of this meat. What NAFTA establishes is that if there's no scientific basis justifying the prohibition or a safety measure, then it is not valid. I think this is very important to warranty fair trade with biotechnology. Also, uh, the geographical names or rules of origin, minimum labor standards, environmental standards. As you know, we had parallel agreements that didn't have any penalty measures in the new agreement. We will have the obligation that we have uh, union freedom, no work for minors and labor rules are fulfilled from the World Trade World or Labor Organization. So we will have um, also union freedom and rules according to the most modern. There was some resistance. Some sectors said that we should not accept it that. But we had already accepted that in the TPP. Now, this is consolidated in the new NAFTA. What else? Well, it is the only sector producing some issues. And that's the increase of the rule of origin to 75%. Supposedly, with this, we favor to have the production of parts that are usually imported from Japan or other uh, Asian countries. On one hand, this could be attractive. On the other hand, it is not so easy to materialize this execution because it is not clear 
when these rules will be implemented. Some say 2020, some others 2022. I don't know if these so wide origin rules could be implemented. According to some Mexican negotiators, uh, several companies are complying with this. They are around 70%, so in two years, with no problem, they could implement them. Some others say no. New content rules. 75% of origin rules in the region. United States wanted 50% of a national rule. U.S. didn't, Mexico and Canada did not accept this. They accepted 75%. There's also a rule that at least 50% of the cars should be manufactured by workers that are paid 16 per hour. So this is targeted, that not in zones like Mexico. But how do you count your wages? Robots do not charge. If most of the assembly lines are with robots, well, then technicians, administrators, and probably at some extent, they earn more than $16. But no doubt some companies will be affected by this rule. Another new rule is 60 percent. It is also said that Mexico will have an automotive export limit. I would seen last week 2.4, but today in the morning someone told me, no, it is 2.6. Wishfully it is, because currently we're exporting around 1.8 million cars. What I understand is that the Mexican government said we have a good number of years to reach that quota, and then this will not affect us. And then we will have a new president. 90 million US dollars in parts. And supposedly, we're importing about 70,000. So we have a possible margin. And this is important, because if we exceed this limit, then we apply the national security rule for tariffs. According to the Mexican uh, government, they say we can present or submit a dispute with the WTC, but while we do that, this could be a problem. WTO, so uh, Mexico is calculating, according to Secretary Guajardo, these tariffs cannot survive long because they are against all logic. So Mr. Trump will have to back off. At the same time, Exports are not covered by this minimum of four years. Also talking about dispute resolution, I am running out of time very quick. Chapter 19 was kept by Canada, Mexico. Seems to not have considered it or keep it. As an old panelist in this chapter, I have to say that it was not so wor working so well. There was not a system to force panelists to be appointed timely. The idea was that these uh, should be working faster than the WTO, so I don't think if it is confirmed, because what I understood is that if Canada kept it, Mexico also obtained 19, but we have to see the small letter. If it is three, then it's a bilateral agreement. That's what I believe it's going to happen. And chapter 11, operativity was restricted for the sectors to support foreign investor companies. This is only given for energy, gas, 
infrastructure investment only for five sectors. In the past, it was for all sectors. Is this going to give uh, certainty to investors in Mexico? That's a big question, especially before a government who's not so committed to observe international rules. So what can I say? I cannot go into details about what might happen with the agreement in the U.S. Congress. If Democrats come, probably they want more stringent measures in the labor or other sectors. There is a lot of content, but we hope that in November or December they could sign it. Some experts, experts say that it is not possible because there are some positive and negative aspects that would prevent that, especially in the automotive sector. If you see this as a whole, the agreement as a whole, you could say that, as Mr. Mubarak said, this was an agreement, and there was some insistence that it was amongst these three countries. And at the end, it will be the role model for future agreements in the United States, just like the original NAFTA was. Usually, what happens is that when you have so huge capital investment in the negotiation months after months, it is very difficult that political pressure will push for its approval. And I can say that markets already took their stand. As you know, in the morning, the dollar dropped about 17 cents. So markets already positively reacted at this. So, well, this provides certainty. The trilateral structure is kept. That was very important. If it was bilateral, the positive answer was not possible. So I believe that we are seeing this future now when we get into the details and see the advantages of additional chapters, we could see that this is, in general terms, a positive agreement, even when it is not so uh, beneficial in some aspects. But as some people say, uh, Canadian colonists said, when you cannot find a better option, you need to look for the second best. Well, if it was not possible to have the best, at least the second best, which is not the zero best. The removal of the NAFTA could have meant a disaster. It was worthwhile to stand the lack of respect and bad manners. But we are used to that. We have always had to keep our head cool. In this case, all of us were clear that this agreement was important to strengthen stability and I believe that Lopez Obrador will step in with a firm position, and that's why he was supporting it so well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Doctor, 